From Microbe TV, this is Tweevo, This Week in Evolution, episode 19, recorded on May 22nd, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels LD. Hey, Vincent. Great to be here. Good to get back in circulation after a little bit of time off. Now, what was our last one? Number 19, uh, number 18. But what did we do? So we had a couple oh, of... The ant guys. That's right. That's right. From Rockefeller. That was fun. A couple of guys joined you in studio. And then one of their colleagues, uh, right. Sylvia, who is now good. at Utah. That was a good by. one. The That's first fun, yeah. CRISPR mutant of an ant. That was pretty yeah. cool. Huh. Raider ants. Yeah. Well, we have a guest today right here in New York City. He is the Maxwell Geffen Professor of Medical and Scientific Journalism at the Columbia University School of Journalism, Jonathan Weiner. Welcome to Twi- of Twivo. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for Vincent. coming up. I get my podcast mixed up. <laughs> yeah. You've got, you're running an empire over there. Well, I wish it were an empire, but... It's not quite. <laughs> so everyone who's listening should know the work of uh, Jonathan Weiner. He's written so many cool science books like Beak of the Finch, Long for This World, Time, Love, Memory, His Brother's Keeper, The Next 100 Years, Planet Earth. I would say one of the most distinguished science writers on the planet. Is that a good name? Why, thank you. And how cool is it? You got the Pulitzer Prize for uh, Beak of the Finch. And your your office is in Pulitzer Hall. Is that a requirement for being there? <laughs> it, it does cross my mind sometimes. <laughs> so were you there before or after uh, getting that prize? The prize came about 10 years before I, I joined there. Columbia. Wow. Yeah. Mm. So that's pretty cool. And I bet not everyone there has a Pulitzer, right, who's working in Pulitzer Hall? Not everyone, but enough so that uh-huh. uh, uh, I have company. That's great. That's really cool. Let's see. I have a uh, one Nobel laureate in this building, and Nels, you have someone at your place too, right? Yeah, we do. Mario Capecchi is yeah. just a floor away. So Richard Axel is in this building, uh-huh. although he's going to be moving down to that new campus, uh, which they're building at 125th Street. Yeah, uh, spectacular new building. Across the street, yeah. we have Eric Kandel, also two Nobel laureates. Right? Yeah, and not they, too shabby. No, nope, not bad. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, your writing, your work, and we have some. We have a lot of questions for you, but I want to first go over your history. <laughs> where, where you said you're from, New Jersey originally. Is that where you were born? No, I was born uh, right near Columbia's campus, actually, <laughs> Columbia's main campus. <laughs> uh, my father was a scientist at Columbia. He uh-huh. was. Uh, uh, he was a material scientist, interested I was say, in. He wasn't Thomas Hunt Morgan, right? <laughs> he, he was not, and he wasn't Norbert Wiener either. <laughs> material scientist, wow. Yeah, he was interested in materials at the level of the uh, atoms and the molecules, mm. and what makes steel rigid, what makes yeah, yeah. Uh, rubber bands snap back. And uh, around the time that I was born, he was beginning to think about thermodynamics mm. and. Uh, uh, wrote a book about it with a colleague called Theory of Thermal Stresses, which came mm-hmm. out just as I was going into... Well, he was finishing it when I went into first grade. And by then, we no longer lived here in Manhattan. Uh, uh, my folks had moved to Hillsdale, New Jersey, just mm-hmm. over the bridge, wow. which we can see right now, the George yeah, Washington Bridge, through the fog, right. very foggy yeah. evening. So you, so he started commuting back and forth. Yeah, which was a, a sore subject, I yeah. think, with him. Uh, he missed the luxury of living right near sure. school. He lived in, in faculty housing, I presume? Uh, I'm not sure if it was faculty housing. I guess it probably was. I passed my parents' first apartment all the time when I walked to and from work. <laughs> it's That really means something to me, I, I'd say, more than seeing Pulitzer Hall over, mm-hmm. over the doorway, walking yeah. through the gate at, uh, of Columbia sure. and remembering sure. being there when I was, you know, three yeah. years old, some of my first memories. I'm sure. 
Yeah, and Jonathan, do, would you go and spend time in your father's laboratory as you're growing up? <laughs> you know, I wished he had a laboratory, Nels. He didn't. Mm-hmm. I used to brag to uh, to my friends in elementary school mm-hmm. that he had crystals in his study mm-hmm. at home because uh. he worked on what he worked on steel crystals and things like that. That I knew, but I didn't really understand that the work involved no experiments and no physical objects at all. It was all Mm. formulas on the paper napkins at the dinner table. And Mm. uh, I used to watch him write those. And that was my Mm. first glimpse of science in action. Interesting. Did that give you some kind of interest in science, you think? Him him, uh, being a scientist, basically? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It was was very, uh, clearly very exciting Mm. to him. He he was very focused on his work, both as a teacher and as a scientist, and I was extremely impressed. I, you know, I was five, six years old when I first became aware of what my father did, and um, his friends would come over, and they would talk science, and so I grew up really uh, around scientists mm. and asking them about what they did, and in retrospect, although... Uh, you live life in a surprise, a state of surprise and zigzagging mm. around. But in retrospect, I I ended up doing something very similar to what I was doing back then growing mm. up. Yeah, interesting. And you said he had written a book. So do you think that that sort of was our, like, was wearing off on you or inf- influencing you? Even? <laughs> I think it did. I think it yeah. did. You know, he revered books and writers. He, uh, uh, although he was a very focused uh, uh, scientist, he also loved the arts. Mm. And so, he was always reading in the evenings and telling us about Faulkner or Samuel Johnson mm. or Heming, whatever the latest, his latest discovery was. Uh, and uh, so, I grew up with this feeling that science was, science is wonderful and also the arts are wonderful and maybe the best thing in the world to be is a writer. Mm. 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 I think that uh, I miss living near a campus because I mm. would guess that he loved that because he could get together with people at any hour, right? It's not, the day doesn't end when you leave. Yeah, he really did miss that. And uh, and it was a kind of a culture shock for him too because in those days, Hillsdale, I'm not sure what it is now, what it's like now, but in those days, he was the only commuter mm. uh, around. Every, it, and... Uh, and so he was so focused on New York and his yeah. job, and yeah, I think he felt a little bit like a, a, a fish out of I'm water. Sure, I mean, I've never lived uh, near. I, I lived at Col- in New York my first seven years here, but um, was I lived way far away from here, so I've never really lived on campus. And then mm-hmm. I left New York, so I've always missed being able to walk back at any time and meet someone for a coffee or whatever. I just think that's like you can do at Princeton, right? You can just right. stroll back on campus and meet your colleagues or students or whatever. I think that's so important and, and central to university life and just missed it. It's too bad. Mm. Yeah, I hear you kind of living the life of science. And I, I have to say, you know, this your story, Jonathan, reminds me a little of my own. So my father, who is a listener of Twivo, by the way, Vincent, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> um, he was a neuroscientist, just retired recently. And so I remember growing up in his lab, uh, going there nights, evenings, weekends. And, you know, it wasn't at the time I, there were mice being dissected, their brains being shaved into thin sections. But I wasn't really paying attention. I was really excited because they had all the newest computers on hand. And so I didn't really, it's just even now that I think I'm kind of starting to realize how much that influenced me or how much those experiences rubbed off the same way that you're describing, Jonathan. It's Mm -hmm. really fun. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, you mentioned you're you're born um, near Columbia. And I'm going to take a line from Time Love Memory. When your father walked into the hospital room, did your did your mother say, how's, these, how's the metal or how's the materials? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I know what was said because uh, it was a family story. I was born on Thanksgiving Day. Uh-huh. And when my mother came to from the anesthetic, she said, is my baby a turkey? <laughs> I don't know what the answer was. <laughs> it's funny. Because here in, in Time, Love, Memory, I think it was Thomas Hunt Morgan. He went to see his wife after their first child was born. And she said, how's the white-eyed 
fly, right? That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. I know. It's such a great story. Morgan Morgan was inventing genetics and really yeah. inventing yeah. modern yeah. modern biology, 20th century biology, and he knew it. He knew how important it was, mm-hmm. and his wife was very excited about the work, too. So, um, that white-eyed mutant, that yeah. first mutant, had so much importance. Sure. And uh, it must have seemed perfectly natural for that for the conversation to go that way. Absolutely. Oh, that's just great. There's so many great stories in there. It's just, I love, I mean, that's how to make science appealing, right? You weave it with stories of people. That's what I think, too. I And uh, I think story pulls readers in Absolutely. who might not think that they're interested in science. No. Uh, and yet, it's appealing for those like you who are deep in science yeah. and love science, but maybe you haven't heard that story no. about Thomas no, Hunt I mean, Morgan. I knew all the yeah. pl- I know all the players. I knew Morgan. I didn't know them. I know their stories, Morgan and Benzer and, and Max Delbrook, but all mm. these great stories. Like Delbrook, I didn't realize every time he went to a seminar and walked out, it's the worst seminar I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> right. He was a crusty guy by all accounts. I never met him either, but uh, very crusty and yet beloved. Yep. Yep, absolutely. I'd, I'd say we probably have a few colleagues like that who have that same reaction to each seminar they hear. Yeah, there's, there are people who, uh, for example, Howard Temin used to sit in the front row mm-hmm. and uh, ask the, the most mundane questions, it, which would give everyone fits, he would raise his hand and say, what was the magnesium concentration in that experiment? You know, not really something that mm-hmm. is, so, is so much of interest, but it's a legend around him. So did you go to high school in uh, Hillsdale, New Jersey then? I went to elementary school there, mm. and um, my dad had two sabbaticals during mm. that time. So one year in Italy when I was four and five years old, and... Um, Mm. I can still say, whenever I go to Italy, I can say, Oh, abitato in Italia, oh, quando ero <laughs> quattro anni. <laughs> and then I'm stuck after that because people go, Oh, yeah, they start talking then, to you. Yeah. yeah. So, so that year in Italy, which was a fantastic year and uh, opened my eyes to the, to the wide world. And, uh, and then seven years later, a year in Israel, my dad uh-huh. was at uh, the Technion in mm-hmm. Haifa. And uh, I still remember vividly weekend picnics at the Caves of Carmel, which are just outside mm-hmm. Haifa. And they're spectacular caves where back then you could just, you could just picnic, you could wander around and pick mm-hmm. up flint hand axes hmm. from the Paleolithic, wow. and we did, and I have one of those hand axes on my desk to this day. Uh, there were there were handprints, painted handprints, of um, Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons, mm-hmm. I'm not sure which, right on the, right Amazing, on the wall, yeah. one entrance to one of the caves, and uh, there it was. So, those were fantastic years. They were really important years years to me. And then we moved. My father, uh, like many professors at Columbia, particularly in engineering, uh, uh, was very disturbed by the riots of 68. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's interesting, if you look at the history, the biologists in, at Columbia tended to participate in those demonstrations. <laughs> the engineers really uh, put up the the barricades and tried to ignore them, you know, lock mm. the doors. So my father was part of an exodus after 68. Mm. And uh, in 69, he went to Brown University. So that was high school for me, it was Providence. Mm. Uh, but I continued to be, you know, an, a, a very eager faculty brat. I got mm-hmm. to know many of my dad's colleagues there. And also many of my friends in high school, classical high school in Providence, which was a terrific school, um, were children of professors at Brown Mm -hmm. and and became scientists themselves, some of them. So it continued to be that kind of world. I still was asking lots of questions and uh, uh, 
thinking maybe I would become a biologist myself. Mm -hmm. That was, okay. that was a thought that or a photographer or a writer or a publisher for a little while, magician, <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of possibilities yeah. in the mix. Yeah. It's good right. though. The more, the better, right? That's why right. Why? That's right. Yeah. Why said, in fact, uh, you should go to college without really w worrying about what you're going to do. But unfortunately, we put a lot of pressure on kids now to, to decide even before they go to college, right? Well, I decided <laughs> the minute I got to college, uh, I, I went to Harvard. Huh. I thought going there that I would be a biologist mm -hmm. or a writer. And within about two hot minutes, mm -hmm. I decided it was writing. And then... Really? Yeah. Wow. I knew it was going to be writing. And I also felt um, being at that point, a rebellious teenager. Mm. I felt that having chosen writing, I now had to despise science. Mm. And so, huh. I spent those four years of college taking all the creative writing workshops I could and avoiding science. Science, huh? Well, and, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, and in that decisive decision to become a writer, was there a specific event or was it just sort of a series of things kind of building up? Well, I I was already really passionate about writing, mm -hmm. and um, and what tipped the scales for me was um, going to the open house, I guess, or the first um, lecture of a biology one hundred and one sort of course, and um, th remembering an AP bio class that I had taken <laughs> and how much memorization, you know, ha I had to memorize the Krebs cycle, for instance. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, you know, I was really turned off by that, by all the memorizing you had to do that. I loved biology, but I didn't love that. I had always hated classes that made you memorize. Um, I rebelled against language requirements also and just mm. barely got by because I was so sullen and ornery mm. about having to memorize, uh, you know, to my sorrow, uh, to my loss, but that was the way it was. So, I went, I, I, I'm not sorry I chose the writing. I think I would have chosen the writing uh, no matter what. I think that's really what suited me best. But, mm. um, uh the apple was trying to roll very far from the tree. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was your actual major? Uh, I was an English major. English major. Yeah. Okay. English and American language and literature. That mm -hmm. was what it was called back then. I, I have to ask if you ever ran into Jim Watson while you were there. Not while He was while probably I was, gone, right? Uh, I'm not sure. I have to look that up. I think he might have been there for a little while. I didn't see him uh, and I know I would have noticed because I had I really loved the double helix yeah, in yeah. fact reading the double <laughs> helix it came out when I was a freshman in high school and I pitched it uh, you know it was a bestseller yeah, sure, I yeah. pitched it to the editors of the laureate which was the high school literary magazine mm -hmm. uh, and said I'd like to write a review and uh, I got the assignment, and I wrote the review. So I guess that's my first published effort as a yeah. science writer. And I was very excited about it. I loved the book. Yeah. Uh, I had no, I, I didn't pick up any of the uh, the things that now, looking back, make you feel a little bit queasy about mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Watson and Crick and Rosalind Franklin. Yeah, I just thought, wow. He's he's not that much older than I am, and yeah. look what he did, <laughs> and uh, and so I wrote that review. I, so I would have I would have noticed Watson. I did notice B. F. Skinner, who uh, mm -hmm. was still wandering around the campus and uh, looked very distinctive and impressive. Mm -hmm. But I I didn't tune into the scientists yeah. then the way I would now. I. Uh, I was very aware of the writers. Elizabeth Bishop was there, Robert Lowell, two of the greatest poets of the 20th century. And uh, so, that's what, that's what excited me. I did listen to one lecture of E.O. Wilson's because mm -hmm. a friend of mine said, you have to do this, we have to go, and we sat in the back. I don't remember too much about it. Uh, so... Um, so, no, it was a fairly one-sided education that I managed to give myself against my father's gentle uh, uh, advice. 
<laughs> back then it was it was gentle but what was, uh, what was he thinking as you did that you, you probably told him right away you were majoring in english right yeah he was he was very good about it i have to say he uh, he recognized uh uh the passion he really got hmm. that and he was uh excited or seemed to be excited that uh both his sons my my kid brother also became a writer that mm. both his sons had uh you know caught fire about something mm-hmm. and that's what mattered to him it's important right yeah that's it without that nothing so he was uh, he was very supportive always was mm. it's funny that's because great. you in in time love you know, you're writing about watson and eo wilson and it must be so weird that you were at the same place, yet you didn't see them much, and now you're writing about. <laughs> yeah, well, I have to say, I, I've I've made up for lost time. Yeah, I, yeah, I've spent yeah. so much of my working life since college, yeah. uh, hanging around in labs and following biologists and mm. following their work, um, and I don't think it was really a bad foundation for uh, for the work I do to have tried to be a poet. I always put it that way, that I tried to be mm-hmm. a poet, not mm-hmm. that I was. Uh, because um, uh, why shouldn't writing about science be done by writers who have a love for words? Sure. That's, yeah. uh, uh, you know, and that's something I try to get across to my students, actually, when mm-hmm. I teach writing about science. Read poetry. Read the best prose there is. And some of it's been written by scientists, but a lot of it has been written by poets and and uh, novelists and essayists. And many of the great writers did love science and wrote mm-hmm. about science. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What spectacular advice. And I think also and maybe another example of how these universities, uh, a campus with all kinds of things going on, is a great place to be for this exact reason. You start to mingle ideas and approaches even you, you know your example, Jonathan, of seeing E.O. Wilson, maybe that had a little influence as things went forward. It might have. It might have. And I also, uh, I, in high school, before I before I really hit the teenage rebellion stage, uh, uh, as I said, I, I I was really serious about biology as well as writing, and so mm. I went to visit labs at Brown. I took. Uh, I sat in on psychology colloquia. Uh, back then, a lot of it was Skinnerian, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it was, you know, I was very excited about it. It was fascinating. <clears throat> Sorry, fascinating to me. So, uh, one one of my friends, it turned out, had uh, uh, my friend Mike Rothman's father, Frank Rothman, was a young biologist at the time at Brown who studied Dictyostelium discoideum, the, the slime mold, the social amoeba. Mm-hmm. And um, I was really excited about that. I, mm. I had read a great article by John Tyler Bonner of Princeton yep. in Scientific American about slime molds. And so to think that they were, they were right there and through Mike, I could get <laughs> to see them if his dad would show me. And, and so I went to the lab and uh, he was nice enough to show me around the lab. And then what's more, because Mike and I were friends, uh, uh, he invited me to join the family on a summer trip to Woods Hole that summer uh, and to go with him to a, um, to a conference about the social amoeba. I, 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 that seems pretty narrow for the size <laughs> of the conference. I may have been broader than that, but... That was exciting, mm, too. Sure. So, uh, you know, it was... I was really re- cutting off my nose to spite my face uh, for, <laughs> for those years. It, I just didn't see how you could put the two together. I really genuinely mm. thought that uh, uh, a writer had to... Um, it was a different species. Uh, a writer had to uh, put a huge distance between himself and uh, and the scientific worldview. Really, I think it was that particular young writer who had to put a huge distance between himself and his dad so, for yeah, those yeah. years. But sure. you, at the time, you weren't thinking about writing about science. You were just going to write about whatever. That's right. Right. That's right. And when I graduated. 
that's what I did. I wrote about all sorts of things, mm -hmm. but uh, I also wrote a little essay about the social amoeba, yeah. and uh, <laughs> and uh, that essay took off. Huh. It was published in Harvard Magazine un under the title "Marching Along with the Social Amoeba," mm -hmm. and. Um, Ed, an editor read it and invited me to apply for a job at the magazine The Sciences, which was published by the New York Academy right. of Sciences. It's a right. beautiful magazine, beautifully written. And I got that job, so I joined them in as, as an assistant editor. And then the editor said, if you, uh, if you like, why don't you write more essays like Marching Along with the Social mm -hmm. Amoeba for the magazine? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, so I did that, and those essays led to the, uh, the offer from um, from PBS to write the companion volume to uh, a show they were putting together called Planet Earth, right. and that became right. my first book. So uh, you know, I've often said I've, I'm still marching along with the social amoeba, <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I'm still friends with John Tyler Bonner, who was the hero of that little essay. Yep. He's now 97, wow. and he's still going <laughs> strong, and uh, he just sent me his latest essay to read, asking my opinion. Amazing. Mm. No, I love his writing. I, I discovered him years ago, and I, he wrote a book which whose name I forgot all about uh, uh, this slime mold, or, mm -hmm. which is what he worked mm -hmm. on. I forgot what it was. And what I really was impressed was that you know, he had a great career at Princeton, and then he retired, and they gave him an office and let him stay because they said he's a resource. That's which, right. Which, of course, we can't do here. <laughs> yeah. If we don't have grants, we have to go. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, he was a treasured member of the faculty, yeah. and so he was there for a long time after. Life Cycles, that was the name of the book. Yeah, that's a beautiful book. That's great. That's a beautiful book. Well, I'm proud to say that uh, I read that in manuscript. Uh, ah, John great. and I nice. often show each other the, our, our manuscripts, get advice. So it's funny, uh, Carl Zimmer, who we had on, on TWIV a while ago, he was, an, he was mm -hmm. an English major also at Yale. That's right. And his first job was Discover Magazine. Uh-huh. And that's where he got into science. Uh -huh. yeah. And he said, wow, I like this stuff. <laughs> yeah. And of course, he'd never even thought about science in, in college. It's really amazing. So out of college, you got a job with Science Magazine. Does that still exist? Uh, uh, the Scientist. The Scientist. Uh, uh, the Sciences, it was called. Uh, no, unfortunately mm -hmm. not. The, um, uh, the magazine never attracted much advertising. Mm -hmm. And so the New York Academy of Sciences decided to kill it some mm -hmm. years ago. And uh, those of us who knew and loved it are still in mourning for the Sciences Magazine. But while it existed, it was a fantastic place. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only was it, I think, a good magazine, but it was a wonderful place to learn how to write about science because young editors like me were assigned to edit the work of the articles mm -hmm. of fabulous scientists who weren't used to writing for a general audience and so needed mm. help there. Mm. And uh, I got to um, to work with some extraordinary people. Sure. One of my first yeah. assignments was to edit an article by Hans Bethe about mm -hmm. the origin of the universe. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. So, um, so I learned a lot from the scientists who could write beautifully for a general mm -hmm. audience and also from those who could not and and needed a lot of a lot of uh help and uh and it was also good for me in those first years that it was essentially anonymous writing because mm -hmm. even if I put a, a a lot into an article it wouldn't be my name over it mm -hmm. it would and uh and so that freed me up a little bit as I was learning my way th through. Hmm. Do you think there's still room for a journal like that? Maybe a reemergence of something like it? Or is the playing field really different now with things kind of fragmented and people vying for attention in all corners? There, there is a magazine somewhat like it right now. It's called Nautilus. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but I've heard, unfortunately, that they're having some financial troubles uh, so I don't know how long uh, a future the Nautilus has, but um, no, it is tough. It's it's tough to make a go of it. I think it always has been in that in that niche. Science, putting together science and art, science and literature, 
uh, making a magazine work. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that. It always was a challenge, but it was it was fun while it lasted. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. we illustrated the magazine with fine art, always with mm-hmm. fine art. So, mm-hmm. say uh, a particle physicist was writing about uh, some some new theory about muons the illustration would not be a a graphic the illustration would be maybe jackson pollock Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh that was really evocative and it was fun and it was also in that same spirit of bringing together uh the sciences and the arts there's a magazine put together by the simons foundation it's called quanta Mm. which is you know they they support it uh they put a lot of money into it and they've hired some good writers they have some contract writers, and they write about different areas of science, and they have good articles every week. Uh, it's all online, though. Mm-hmm. It's not a physical magazine, but not, I, I was on the board for a while, and they, they do a good job. So maybe that's another uh, example. Now, of course, they give it away, and they support it because Simons are billionaires, right? Mm-hmm. And they can do that, but it's great that they are. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, that's wonderful. So when you were working at the sciences, that's... A, Mm-hmm. Were, were you here in New York City? Yes, I was. That was my first incarnation. Well, I guess that was my second incarnation as a New Yorker. Mm. First, mm. up until the age of three. <laughs> <laughs> then I came back and I was here for five or six years mm-hmm. and uh, met my wife during that time. Uh, we started a family. Our first son was born. And suddenly, New York wasn't working so well for us because mm-hmm. we were too writers starting out, and it was one expensive place to be. So we moved to um, Pennsylvania, to a small town in Pennsylvania, Doylestown, which um, was close to her family and also was close to a lot of beautiful countryside. Mm. And we raised the kids there and worked on our writing there. Uh, And then about 20 years later, this offer came up from Columbia, and we moved back to New York. Doylestown, I know, because it's near Merck. Merck headquarters used to be there, right? Bluebell, Pennsylvania? Uh, not like? that close, uh, but yeah, same general yeah, yeah. territory. Uh, quite a few big pharma executives lived in Doylestown and around there. So in those 20 years, you did a lot of writing, obviously. That's right. right. That was, uh, yeah, I had my uh, my nose to the grindstone. What was your first book? Well, when we moved, I was in the middle of a uh, my second book. I'd written Planet Earth. Hmm. Planet Earth covered the covered the planet. It, uh, it was it was the companion to a seven part series about uh, about Earth science as mm-hmm. it stood then in the early nineteen eighties. And uh, so I talked, to, and it was uh, sponsored by IBM and the National Academy of Sciences. So I had a chance to talk with many of mm-hmm. the the countries and the world's leading Earth scientists. And uh, when it was done, I thought about the next book, and I thought the most important thing that I've learned in the course of writing this is that scientists seem to be getting more and more concerned about uh, what was then called the greenhouse effect Mm -hmm. or global warming. And nobody was talking about it back then. It It was just the the germ of an idea that many of the world's leading earth scientists were beginning to talk about and reach reach a mm. consensus so i thought that's a book this has to be mm. this has to be told so i spent much of the 80s first here in in new york and then uh from doylestown hanging around with uh, students of global warming and uh, traveling around the world hmm. to uh, watch their research in the field and uh, and wrote a book called The Next 100 Years. Hmm. And I called it that because it seemed very clear already by, by uh, the late 1980s that this was going to be the dominant, the dominant problem of... of uh, planet earth and its inhabitants for it for the next hundred years and i tried very very hard with that book to uh to get the science across and like most of the scientists i i was i was hanging around with i had the innocent 
delusion <laughs> that that's all it would take. You just had to get across the science and it would make mm. a big difference in the course of the, the rise of CO2. And if, it hasn't, hasn't done that. To this day, it doesn't. Right? No, no, yeah. it hasn't. That was exasperating. It was incredibly frustrating to publish that book mm. and, um, and, and see no change. And, uh, and of course, the scientists ex experienced that to the nth degree because this was yeah, their, yeah. this was their career. Uh, so that was my, that was the book that I brought with me to Doylestown. And I still remember writing the chapter about forests with our second child who was a newborn that week mm. on my lap, <laughs> sleeping on my lap. Yeah. And I dedicated the book to Aaron and Benjamin. Huh. Yeah. So in, in uh, Pennsylvania, you wrote, quite a few of your books, right? Well, let's see. So, um, uh, The Next 100 Years, and then The Beak of the Finch, and then Time, Love, Memory. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right. And I started uh, His Brother's Keeper, but I... I th yeah, no, I, I finished that there also. Hmm. So, um, uh, when... When we moved back to New York for this latest incarnation as mm -hmm. New Yorkers, I was in the middle of uh, uh, my latest book, Long for This World, which is about the biology of, uh, of aging. Right. Um, why did you uh, decide to take a university job? You do, was it a financial decision or was it just intellectual or both? Uh, it was both. It was both. Uh, it was... It was becoming clear by um, uh, oh, the mid 1990s after I'd been I'd been supporting basically supporting us as, mm -hmm. uh, for ten years that this was a tightrope act and um, we were I was walking back and forth on a tightrope mm -hmm. every year and uh, it was very suspenseful. It was a tough way to uh, to make yeah, a living and yeah. keep the roof over our heads. So I thought about teaching, and of course, I didn't have I had a I didn't have far to think. I had a great model in um, in my dad there because he always loved teaching, and uh, I taught just to try it out at Princeton. Uh, Princeton has a wonderful program called the McGraw Fellowship. Uh, they bring in practicing writers and journalists to be the McGraw fellow or the McGraw professor. And I really enjoyed that. So, um, I taught again at Princeton and, uh, writing about science, writing about the environment. Then I had a chance to be writer in residence at Rockefeller university. And I loved that. So, um, when this opportunity came up, uh, at Columbia, it made great sense financially and uh it was also thrilling to me to come back to new york i miss new york i really felt like an exile from new york after a while and uh, and also it's a you know as you know it's a wonderful it's a wonderful life you get to continue to do the research and the the work you want to do uh, uh for me in the writing and um uh the teaching itself is rewarding so you you teach as soon as you came did you start teaching and developing your own courses is, yes and now you teach two different courses is that correct or more um yeah I think I've 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 now taught several courses mm -hmm. at the journalism school uh, my my main course the one that I was hired to teach is uh, it, it, it's a one year program called the MA science seminar and I co-teach it with mm -hmm. Marguerite Holloway who mm -hmm launched the program at the journalism school and what it is it's a it's a one-year program for young to mid-career journalists who've decided that they really want to dive deeply into writing about science or nature or medicine or the environment so um, we give them a very intense year in which the lectures alternate between talks by Marguerite or by me about the nuts and bolts and the special challenges of writing about writing about technical subjects like these, uh, and then we bring in uh, 
scientists from around Colombia and sometimes uh, uh, farther afield to talk about their work mm -hmm. and introduce their fields to these young journalists. And uh, you know this very well, Vincent, because you've become a regular in the, mm -hmm. in the program and it's fantastic for the students because you place a great value in communicating science to the public and talking about viruses. And every time you come to my class, I think within 10 minutes, everyone sitting around the seminar table is thinking, gee, why didn't I become a virologist? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. What a, what a great partnership. How big are, how big are these classes that you, that you two are involved in? Uh, well, they range from seven students, that's what I had this year, to um, as many as 15 or 16. But I really like uh, the smaller, the smaller mm -hmm. size, uh, you know, seven or ten people around a seminar table so that everybody feels free to, to chime in and, and uh, speak up. And it's a real conversation. I, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, have, I teach in one class of your one lecture a year but it's three hours mm -hmm. and i now as i always bring like 180 slides right <laughs> and uh -oh. these <laughs> students they have so many good questions i might i yeah. might get through 30 of them but it's fine exactly. because they, they're learning what they want to know mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah. and i just yeah. love it because they are they are totally wowed like wow i didn't know that <laughs> That's right. That's right. In fact, I have one, an email from one of them who wants to talk some more. About, that's great. About something. Yeah, that's terrific. Yeah. yeah. And that's, see, that's the advantage of coming to these subjects fresh, um, uh, as I did since I was a, essentially a poetry yeah. major in college. I mean, you're so, you're learning and um, you're you're ecstatic. You're so excited. You're learning all the yeah. time. And pl and plus, it's New York, it, so you have incredible people to select from. Mm -hmm. Columbia will attract so many people, so you can just pick from within New York City, and, and they're going to mm -hmm. get amazing people talking to them. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. In fact, you mentioned uh, Eric Kandel. Uh -huh. Eric came and visited my class this this past spring, and, uh, and you did, and uh, a wonderful... Um, uh, regenerative medicine expert named Gordana Nonyak uh, Novakovic, who just her. became yeah. university yep. professor here. I know her, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so many people to draw from. Yeah. It's just in, amazing. In past <laughs> years, Oliver Sacks was, was always, uh, I, I saved him for last, and he would mm -hmm. always speak at the, uh, in the early spring. Yeah. Yep. Now, some of, some, of the, um, some of the things you write about are, tough like i i read beak of the finch uh last year and there were parts that were even hard for me so how do you how do you do this how do you it must take you a long time you have to figure things out do you do it on your own or do you do you consult people do you sit down and, and say explain this to me how, how does that work the tough science yeah all of that all of that uh uh, I read textbooks. I do a lot of remedial reading. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, uh, I go hang around, as I said, in the labs uh -huh. or, or out in the field, and uh, I'll walk through papers, uh, technical papers, if mm. they're difficult, with the authors, and uh, uh, you know, bit by bit, step mm -hmm. by step, it starts to make sense to me. You can't explain these things unless you're able to go deeply into them and um, understand them yourself so uh, that's part of the challenge but also part of the part of the excitement mm -hmm. and yeah and, yeah uh, sorry go ahead Nelson. no no not at all so and maybe a related question to that I'm wondering kind of how you think about the balance of the scientific details on these sort of complicated subjects versus what you already kind of mentioned before this idea of the poetry of writing and you know I think we'll talk more specifically about time love memory in a minute but you know, for there, like one of the examples that comes to mind is when you describe chromosomes as threads. How are you? How are you kind of making those decisions to sort of balance the scientific ideas with the poetry? Well, um, I have to say, I'm not really thinking in those terms so much of of um, a balance. I'm I'm thinking in terms of um, the beauty of the story. I mean, mm -hmm. to me, it is beautiful it, 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 that that Peter and Rosemary Grant 
of Princeton, for instance, spent so much of their lives on that little speck of rock in the <laughs> archipelago, in the Gal- in Darwin's Islands, and they could see evolution happening before their eyes. I mean, that's extraordinary. So, yeah. so I'm just I'm just trying to uh, show that to the reader. I'm trying to paint that, um, and I guess I do calculate a little bit. Uh, if if I feel like um, uh, a couple of pages have been heavy, uh, I will try to find some way of bringing in a story, uh, mm-hmm. uh, intercutting something, making it part of a scene. Um, f- I learn best myself, not from textbooks and not from classrooms, but from watching people work and listening to them talk about what they do. In mm-hmm. fact, uh, not far from where we're sitting, there's a laboratory where a couple of young neuroscientists showed me the, uh, the spike. They showed me uh, how if you tickle um, uh, the whisker of a mouse, you, you get this spectacular spike on the uh, oscilloscope. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... I'd never seen that before. <laughs> and the, I was excited, and they were excited. Yeah. Uh, I think they would have been excited even if I hadn't been there going, wow. <laughs> well, mm. now and then, they ran into a little glitch in setting, in setting up the experiment to show me the, uh, the spike. Mm-hmm. And at one point, I went off and started reading some papers and uh, reading some textbooks and reading a little bit about the history of the science. And I found it so much more uphill than what I was getting from the immersive experience of watching these guys work and seeing the spike and hearing their excitement, their enthusiasm. So that's what I try to get across on the page. So I want readers to have that same, you know, for instance, again, back to Daphne Major in the Galapagos. I had spent, before I visited the grants on Daphne Major, I had spent about a year reading textbooks, reading their papers, interviewing people about uh, about the work, and it still hadn't quite made sense to me, come together for me, until I just watched them on this the rim of the <laughs> volcano measuring the, the beaks of the finches. Mm-hmm. Then it just, it all comes mm-hmm. together. So that's, why not give the reader that same uh, sense of, of uh, the reality of the work? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so did, is this correct? I think I remember reading this somewhere. You actually only spent two weeks... On Daphne Major, is that right? Well, much less than that on Daphne. Yeah, I spent uh, three weeks in the Galapagos. Mm-hmm. I was traveling around with uh-huh. a former student of the grants named David Anderson, who's now at Wake Forest. And uh, we spent only one short morning on Daphne Major. So um, that was that was agonizing. When we sailed away from Daphne Major... Mm. I was sitting on the deck just scribbling every note I could possibly mm-hmm. record about the the short time we'd have wow. on Daphne because I knew that was the only chance I would have to visit the Grants. The thing is, when I read the book, it seems like you were there the whole time. It, How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was that was the biggest challenge of writing uh, that book. I. Uh, uh, I did visit many of their former students, mm-hmm. and um, uh, and they showed me slides. And they one of them gave me a journal that he had kept on Daphne uh-huh. Major when he was their grad student. And uh, gradually, also um, the grants began to trust me enough to share their stories. And uh, so I was able to weave it all together. Mm-hmm. So you must have visited the Grants a lot at Princeton, right? Yeah, I did. I lived right. Doylestown, Pennsylvania is not that far from okay. Princeton. It's part of the reason that we chose Doylestown. That was my center of gravity for mm-hmm. those years. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I spent a lot of time there. I knew most of the biologists at Princeton during those years. I think that's the part of the beauty of your writing is that you can make this seamless story where I thought, you know, you're definitely on the island the whole time because you can't tell when that 
one day or those three weeks began or ended. And the rest is woven from your conversations, your readings. It's the same thing with time, love, memory. You probably didn't spend all that much time with Benzer, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yet you followed him from birth to much later in his career. Yeah. It sounded like you were there the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I loved, uh, I really enjoyed uh, the research with both of those books. Uh, it was, it was extraordinary to be in the Galapagos and to, to uh, get to know Peter and Rosemary and many of the people they worked with. Uh, and Seymour was one of the great personalities mm. I have ever known. Uh, mm. He was uh, he was a remarkable scientist, a remarkable person. So um, we did spend a lot of time talking, but in absolute terms, I don't know what it was. You know, maybe uh, uh, I visited Caltech for a total of two weeks. Uh, but he was very generous with his time and uh, and told me stories late into the night. And he was uh, a night guy. Right? He was a night guy. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I remember sitting by the fire at Caltech at uh, the Athenaeum, that uh, nice uh, faculty house mm -hmm. at Caltech. Uh, and must have been two in the morning, and he's telling me stories about <laughs> growing up in Brooklyn and singing yeah. songs in Yiddish, and yeah. uh, we both had a great time. Yeah. Is it hard to get uh, scientists' time like that, or are they eventually open up and it's okay? Well, not everybody uh, uh, is game for, mm -hmm. for that, but um, once... Once you have some experience and people can look at the work you've done and get a feeling for what uh, what you're after, it's much easier to get access. Hmm. So, and what was the idea for getting going with time, love, memory? What was the inspiration for that, or how did what was how was that conceived? Well, I'll tell you uh, if if you don't mind, let me back up. The, sure. uh, so after after the next one hundred years. I found I was really stuck. I didn't know what I was going to write about. Mm. And so I looked up John Bonner at Princeton and I said, hey, you got me into this, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> uh, I loved his writing and I loved, uh, I had enjoyed writing about uh, the social amoeba. So he said, you should write about my friends, Peter and Rosemary Grant. They yeah. go to the Galop. So that's how I, that's how I uh, found my way to writing The Beak of the Finch. Mm -hmm. So once that book was done, I had another lunch with John, and I said, all right, what do I do? now what do I do? <laughs> what, what would be another good story? And he said, why don't you have lunch with uh, this, this uh, wonderful neuroscientist, young neuroscientist I know named Ralph Greenspan, and ask him. Uh, so I talked to Ralph, who was then at NYU, and uh, he's now at UCSD. But mm -hmm. uh, Ralph told me about his mentor, Jeff Hall, at Brandeis, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Jeff's work with Mike Rossbash, Michael Rossbash at Brandeis. And he said that they were able to, um, to take a gene that um, influenced the fly's sense of time and the rhythm of its courtship song and they could take it from one fly and give it to another fly and change, you know, the rhythm of its rising and its going to sleep and change the rhythm of its song. I had no idea that anybody was able to do something that concrete and specific with genes and behavior, which mm -hmm. is such a fascinating mm -hmm. area. And yeah. it's it, it sounded to me, even on first hearing, and in fact it is, it remains a, a real breakthrough in that area because it's so concrete. So I went to talk to Jeff Hall, and then I talked to many other people uh, in that field, talked about clock genes and talked about um, genes and memory, genes and... Uh, many different aspects of genes and behavior, and everybody had Seymour stories. Everybody <laughs> talked about Seymour. So, after a couple of years, I think it was, I decided I really have to talk to Seymour. And that was a lucky thing, because mm -hmm. if I had tried to, to talk to Seymour right at the outset, I think I wouldn't have gotten anywhere. He really didn't like to be written about. Neither, neither did, actually, I was making sort of a career of this, because Charles Keeling, 
who um, produced the famous Keeling curve in global warming, the, the demonstrating the rise of CO2 globally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Keeling didn't like to be written about. He was very uncomfortable in that role. He just wanted to make the measurements, get the data, make it as accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. And Peter and Rosemary were very, mm -hmm. remain very private people. And Seymour used to like to say that he'd spend his whole life brushing off reporters like flies. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, Great. Perfect. But he, you know, he was willing to talk to me because I was clearly serious. By then I had, I, I had met so many of his former students mm. and uh, uh, was so interested in the field. And uh, uh, so, and I pointed out that my mother had grown up around the block from him in Bensonhurst. Yeah, that's it. So that was <laughs> that was a calling card. Yeah, I'm sure that was it. It's, I, I just, I, I loved uh, Time Love because I knew the history on its own, from the scientific history of how things went from flies to uh, the molecule and then back to flies again. And, but, Seeing it from your perspective was was great because it's it's poetry. <laughs> well, thank it's you. Putting poetry on the science. In fact, I wrote a note last night. So this is like unlike any science writing I know. I think you're not really a science writer, but a writer of history who happens to be interested in science. Huh. Well, thanks. <laughs> I, I I I'd like to think of myself as a writer who happens to be interested in science, yeah. as, mm -hmm. as a writer first. And um, there are there are other writers like that. I uh, uh, and I I enjoy their writing uh, very much. There's there's a wonderful British writer named Richard Holmes, who is a famous biographer who in recent years has gotten has fallen in love with science. And if you haven't read it, um, I strongly recommend his book, The Age of Wonder, mm -hmm. which is okay. uh, about the the decades of exploration, uh, uh, the Romantic era, when scientists, I I particularly in Britain, hung around with poets, and uh, Humphrey Davy, the chemist, was a good friend of Samuel mm -hmm. Taylor Coleridge, and uh, <laughs> uh, and it's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful beautiful history. But I don't just love history of of science. I I love watching it in action watching people do science in in the present and that's really important to me those scenes right. i love i love writing those scenes sure. but i think you use that to tell the history mm -hmm. or maybe vice versa because if you just recited the science that wouldn't be interesting but you intertwine it with the history and i think that makes all the difference uh, i think the history is great too i'm going to um just mention a couple of things that struck out. I love the little stories that you intertwine, the white fly that we just mentioned. The fly room. Have you ever been to the fly room at Columbia? You know, I never, never have. Because apparently it's still there, right? It, well, what I heard when I arrived was that it was now a, a storage room for art supplies. Really? Yeah. Mm. I don't know whether it's been restored it's or not. Anyway, it used to be in Shermerhorn, right. which is where I taught my class this year. Uh -huh. I thought that was pretty funny. I love this Feynman talking to Benzer. All these brilliant, all these brilliant people talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And he said, "Explain this to my kid." And he started talking about transistors. And he says, "No, no, no! Don't simplify it. It's not a, neurons are not transistors." I love that. Yeah. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking, Nels, why don't we have these conversations? You maybe, <laughs> I mean, you well, and I, but I don't. I don't talk to Richard Axel. You know, I mean, that's that's yeah. how science should be, that these mm -hmm. people talking to each other and just, or, yeah. what I wrote here, do only famous people have their stories told or do only famous people have stories to tell? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, well, I'll tell you, I'll take, give you my opinion for what it's worth, yeah. which is I think everyone has a story to tell. And there are, of course, these conversations happening. Sometimes, you know, I think we almost um, put these things up on a pedestal, but I bet if you asked any of these folks as they were having these conversations that this was just what they were doing and then we look back mm, and yeah. all of these consequential and pivotal things happen which are um you know exciting pivotal moments but i think you know that one of the and one of the things i really love about your writing jonathan echoing on what 
what um, Vincent is saying here is that it kind of had for me it has that feeling you know whether um, Delbrook and Benzer are trading haircuts with each other there's just this sort of everydayness to it and this fun to it which also you're you're bringing up which is really great you know Seymour once said to me uh, because he and his crowd were already famous when uh, by the time I I met him. He was one of the pioneering molecular biologists with Delbrook, uh, as you know, and Watson and Crick. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, he said, back then, we didn't know we were making history. We just were having fun. We were just doing science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's usually the way it is, and that's how it works. If you think you're making history, you won't, right? Uh (laughs) Um, I think Time, Love, Memory should be read by all molecular biologists because it really explains the field. Um, And I think here on Twivo, we have a a connection to this little conflict. You have, see this little quote here. At Harvard, Jim Watson was trying with enormous energy and without enormous tact to pack the biology department with molecular people and get rid of all the deadwood. Field biologists, taxonomists, ecologists, ethologists, and naturalists. But in fact, now we've come full circle and we put the molecular biology to what they're doing to understand all of that. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's what Nels and I are trying to do in Twivo, right, Nels? Yeah, I think this really captures a little bit of the idea um, where these sort of uh, gaps that emerged in the last few generations of science, can yeah. we offer maybe new connections or ways of thinking to um, start to break down what in some cases are real cultural barriers almost when we think about how fields have sort of risen up over decades and there are real kind of cultural styles almost tribalism that can happen from time to time. And so with, I think, the emergence of a lot of new tools and genome scale approaches and even the democratization of experimental um, ability to manipulate things like those flies that were were in the very early work, this idea of taking a behavior encoded on a gene and transferring that from one species to another. Mm -hmm. One of the really exciting things that certainly motivates what um, we're trying to do is to try to kind of spread the word far and wide that there are some real opportunities here, hoping that that will catch someone's eye for sort of the next cool thing. Oh, that's great. It's amazing that the DNA people and the behavior people were, wouldn't talk to each other. That's right. The behavior people said, yeah. DNA, who cares? I mean, it's intertwined, right? We know that now, mm-hmm. and we always, we always did, but it's just incredible. Or the molecular <laughs> biologists at, at one point and um, the evolutionary biologists and when um, when the beak of the finch came out mm-hmm. i went to a dinner at princeton i'm not going to name names <laughs> but it, i sat next to a molecular biologist who said to me very chummily uh you know it was very really tribal and i was sort of wandering between the <laughs> tribes and between the buildings and he said to me yeah look john that you know you had fun writing that story but we 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 all know that's not science. <laughs> Evolutionary biology is not science. And, um, and so I started arguing with him, and just then Peter Grant walked by, mm-hmm. and he said, wow, there's something happening between you because you're, <laughs> you're staring at each other from about, <laughs> about 12 inches apart. And, wow. and I said, that's right. And that air is electrically charged. <laughs> but, um, but now you wouldn't have an argument like that, I don't think, because um, uh, more and more molecular biology is being yeah. done in molecular evolution. And in fact, the grants themselves are collaborating with molecular biologists. Sure. Oh, you have to. And in fact, this book was given to me by Hope, Hopi Hoekstra. Uh-huh. And now I understand why she loves it, because it's, it's all about this divide and how... It started to come back together again. Here's another great quote. Um, They ignored both genetics and molecular biology. They assumed that variations in behavior do pass down from generation to generation, and they left it at that. (laughs) They studied instincts from the outside. Mm. And now we, these same individuals, their new generation like Hopi, are getting both the outside and the inside. So in a way, people like me, who was trained as a molecular biologist— I lack the outside view in many ways, which I regret. And I think that being trained as a field biologist with a talent in molecular biology would be perfect, right? (laughs) So, yeah. So, we're getting past all these tribalisms and science and art or science and literature. Those are tribal also. There's no need for for, uh, walls there. Well, there's never any need. In fact, that brings up another 
thing I, I noticed that someone, uh, you wrote at some point how the, these people would get together and say, well, I'm going to do this experiment and this is my idea. And the person said, we used to be able to talk about things and not worry about someone else doing our experiment. Right. But now you, mm. you don't do that anymore because you're afraid someone's going to go do it so quickly that you'll be scooped. I remember Seymour saying that. And uh, he also lamented just the way you guys were a minute ago that there isn't enough conversation, yeah. enough time for just sitting around and, and, uh, and talking anymore. In fact, um, when I was hanging around in his lab at Caltech, he was in his late seventies. He still had a very big crew of international grad students and postdocs, maybe 20 people from all over the world. And he said, it's harder and harder every year to pry them away from the bench and go out for lunch together or go out for dinner. They just want to stay at the bench. It's what the field has come to. You just have to work all the time. Nels, I was just thinking that, uh, Remember, after Benzer finished his R his R two work, he's looking for something else. Yep. He's just hanging around, thinking and reading. And I'm thinking, where's his funding coming from? Maybe mm-hmm. it didn't matter, right? You can't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think we put so much pressure onto the system, sort of broadly speaking, that now is a time to start to step back and re revisit some of this. And I think there's a a real, even a strategic, uh, and maybe competitive advantage to going out to dinner. Mm-hmm. Uh, or mm-hmm. having that conversation, right? And so I think that's another hope that um, that the tide is turning a bit to sort of rebalance things a little bit and and put back the you know. So just actually before I came to do this recording um, with you two fellas, there was the retirement party for John Atkins. So he spent many years at Cold Spring Harbor along with Ray Jessland, uh, another guy who just retired recently from here. And they, at this retirement, you know, half hour, it was slide after slide of pranks they were pulling on each other, <laughs> uh, you know, driving a car into the lobby of the of the building and putting a parking ticket on it or, you know, just f- snowball fights in the building, you know, just things like this that we sort of let go of. And it was what a great reminder to have fun along the way. Francis Crick liked to say, if you're incredibly busy you're probably wasting your time. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, it's true for writers also. We we don't allow ourselves true. this uh, time to wool gather and meditate and ramble around. I can't tell you how many times I think, boy, you know, if I could just sit around and think for a couple of hours, it would really help, but I'm too busy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Isn't yeah. that terrible? It is. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I make this speech to my students every year. I just finished making it, you know, in the last lecture mm-hmm. last week. I... I think we should give ourselves that time. Uh, for me, it's first thing in the morning. I love to wake up early, like mm. round dawn, and read poetry or or uh, read something that is inspiring and completely apart from the task at hand. And that that keeps my imagination alive. And it mm. shows in your writing because you... You make so many references to literature that no scientist would ever do, or few scientists would ever do, and um, you've obviously read broadly from you know English authors to Shakespeare and all sorts of things. Um, and I want to just read the the three line intro of um, where is it here? I have too many notes. Long for this world. First line: Late August, late afternoon, cloudy bright. That's it. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's even a sentence, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and I'm thinking, no scientist would ever start a book off like that, but you're a writer, <laughs> so you can do that. We'd taken a corner table at the Eagle just inside the red door at Benet Street. I mean, it's just beautiful. You don't even think you're reading a scientific book. And that's why I've, I've, I've told you many times that you're different from all other science writers, because the craft of writing is so obvious. You know, it's just beautiful. Yeah. Thank well, and maybe and maybe a slight mirror image on this uh, that came out of Time Love Memory is you know you also mentioned in several points where uh, for Seymour Benzer how the Sinclair Lewis's book Aerosmith mm-hmm. had a big impact on him, um, and I think that's a for me at least what a great um, you know clue to making sure that uh, I'm bl- broadly exploring literature as well. Are there books that have had a big impact on you as you've been coming up as a writer? You already mentioned the Age of Wonder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Poems. Are there are there others? Well, Age of Wonder is a current enthusiasm. That book came out mm-hmm. just a few years ago. So mm-hmm. um, 
that wasn't in my formative years. I'm pretty much formed. <laughs> but uh, books that really wowed me, uh, uh, that sort of pointed pointed in this direction, um, John Bonner's mm. books uh, were among them. Lauren Isley, uh, a wonderful anthropologist and writer mm-hmm. of um, a generation or two back, that mattered a lot. Walden, Thoreau's Walden, uh, mattered hugely to me. Uh, I loved Walt Whitman, Leaves of Grass, and uh, uh, then there was Lewis Thomas, Lives of a Cell. That mm-hmm. book mattered a lot. Stephen Jay Gould's work, John McPhee's writing about geology and about uh, uh, the environment, uh, ecological issues, um, more from the point of view of wilderness and uh enjoyment of wilderness than uh than biology but uh, uh still uh he really set the bar very very high for narrative writing about science mm. uh he's a hero of mine yeah. do you like uh richard dawkins at all yeah, I I think Richard Dawkins is an excellent writer. I'm I'm always wowed when I read him, but he's in a slightly different genre to me, uh, a very different genre uh, uh, because he's a scientist writing in a voice that might be coming from the podium, and mm-hmm. um, and that's the way many scientists write, uh-huh. and it's very very. Effective. It's very natural and it's effective. Stephen Jay Gould was another mm-hmm. who wrote that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but I, I'm coming at things not from the podium yeah, and not sure. as a scientist. <laughs> so as a writer, I'm I'm uh, uh, I find McPhee say a better model because mm-hmm. McPhee does give you scenes and action and character and setting all of that mm-hmm. uh, all the tools of the novelist in the service of nonfiction. Hmm. does eo wilson also uh, speak from the pulpit sort of mostly yeah. mostly yeah he's another eloquent biologist of course yeah, yeah. and he writes beautifully uh, uh, he does more scene setting and uh uh narrative work than say Dawkins mm-hmm. or or Gould. Uh, uh, if you read his wonderful memoir, Naturalist, for instance, mm-hmm. you get mm-hmm. terrific scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm getting lots of ideas for for more reading. I need to take some time now and, and read. Well <laughs> it's summertime. Yeah. It's summertime that's right. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. So what um what science do you think is cool nowadays? Something that you would want to write about? Well, I'm I'm really attracted to neuroscience these days, and uh, th- the progress since those the days I was writing about in Time Love mm-hmm. Memory is extraordinary. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been trying to figure out how to write a book about neuroscience for a few years now. And um, I've spent a lot of time with neuroscientists here at Columbia, uh, some some young sprouts Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Eric Kandel and Richard Axel and others. Uh, It's a it's it's a powerhouse here, neuroscience. And uh, and I think I'm beginning to figure out how to how to write a book about it. I I don't know if I've got it yet. So we'll see, but that's that's really drawing me. And I'm also working on a, uh, a memoir about my dad, and mm. Mm. Uh, mm. it's a father son story because you know I became the the writer that I did because yeah. of my father, and and uh, my father died last fall, and I really want to I want to tell those stories. Mm. Mm. So when you uh, write a book, it sounds like you take a few years to prepare for it right often yeah well i have that luxury too now that i'm a professor (laughs) that's right (laughs) in uh, in the days when i was walking that tightrope back in in doylestown i couldn't take a couple of years but uh but now i can and uh 
Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it does it does seem to take that sometimes. Mm. Uh, I'm glad I don't have to force it and start writing before I'm I'm really ready to. And then the writing can take years also, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, each of my books has taken years. I mean, the, the first one was the quickest. I, I only had about a year and a half because mm. it had to come out when the TV series aired on PBS. Had mm. to, absolutely had to, drop dead deadline. Uh, ever since then, the deadlines haven't been uh, concrete. And um, the time has stretched out a little bit. So, yeah, yeah. three and a half years, four and a half, five and a half. I think the last book took six years. In fact, that would be my only criticism of you is you don't write enough. <laughs> <laughs> You're very kind. <laughs> but actually, my editor said that too. And I don't think he meant it as kindly. Yeah, he's, he's, well, you can't push it, right? If, if no, it, you know, no, you it can't. It takes what it takes. But that's the problem. And you're... As you said, you have a job, you have a day job, right? Mm -hmm. So you can, I feel that's the same with me. I can podcast because I have a job here. I'm just wondering when I'm not here anymore, what I'm going to do, right? If I can still do this, but that's, mm -hmm. that's something for another day. So do you think you'd like to uh, speak with Charles Darwin if he were around? Oh, yeah, I would yeah. love to. In fact, uh, uh, that's, you know, one of those standard questions, who would you invite to dinner? Yeah, or who would you? that on my list. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, uh, <laughs> he, would, he would be at the top of my list. Yeah. Uh, because he was not only su uh, such an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary scientist, but he was also an extraordinary human being. And you get yeah. that from the letters and the journals. And, and you know, he was a wonderful... Uh, friend to his friends, a wonderful family man, uh, uh, just a delightful human being, a, a hero in every way. So, yeah, I would love to. I would love to have a chance to visit with him. It would be fun. Hey, Nels, would you want to talk with him? Well, yeah, I would. But you know, kind of thinking along these lines, I was, <laughs> um, I was thinking about what gr how great it would be to be in the company of artists. And talking about and, and talking with them. So, I mean, I, as we said a little bit before the show, I was just in Italy and, of course, um, stopped by Florence and was at the Uffizi and seeing some of the great Renaissance stuff. And imagine having dinner with some of those guys. I mean, that would be something. Yeah. Or I don't. Yeah. Or you don't even have to go back that far. So I've been. Um, I actually, in one of my genetics lectures, mentioned Salvador Dali, and there's this one image that he has of uh, walking an anteater coming out of the Paris subway. Of this sort of absurdist idea, hmm. and and I try to use that <laughs> to illustrate uh, how we pick model organisms and what might be genetic model organisms, what might be good choices and more difficult choices, and so I think I don't know that. So I would go towards the artists instead uh -huh. of the scientists at at this stage of the game. Uh huh. But how about you, Vincent? Who who is your living or dead uh, dinner with anyone? What about Pasteur? Yeah. Oh. Oh, I, I've 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 already said this before. Yeah, I know who it would be. I would like to talk to Einstein mm. Mm. for sure, mm. Mm. because it would be interesting to talk to them and then tell him what's going on today in science to get his thoughts about it. I think that would be really cool to get someone who was brilliant but years ago and give them modern day information and mm. see what they do with it. Yeah. So yeah, Einstein would be my or Pasteur would be a good one too. Um, mm. But uh, he was a real long time ago, right? And I'm not well prepared for Pasteur. <laughs> <laughs> Nels, have we taken enough of Jonathan's time, you think? Probably. Yeah, I think we covered almost everything. And my yeah, voice a, is going too. Okay. <laughs> Go what 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 a fun honor to have this conversation. I'm really enjoying it. Um should we do a couple of picks, Nels? Quick sure. Do you have yeah. one here? I don't even remember if you uh I do. So I have a science pick of the week. Um yeah. kind of inspired by um thinking more creatively about the process of science or the process of writing, whatever it is. So I I dug up this quote um, from Ira Glass, actually, so the fellow who does This American Life. Um, and so he has this quote that I've been telling to graduate students, uh, some recently who are you know, going through the regular process of getting a PhD with the highs and the, the lows, and especially getting through the low zones. So there's this quote kind of called The Gap that um, Ira Glass mentions. And I'll, it's not too long. I'll, maybe I'll read it here if I can. Yeah, sure. Um, so nobody tells this to people who are beginners. I wish someone told me, all of us who do creative work, we get into it because we have good taste, but there's this gap. For the first couple of years, you make stuff. It's just not that good. 
it's trying to be good, it has potential, but it's not. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, is still killer. And your taste is why your work disappoints you. A lot of people never get past this phase, they quit. Most people I know who do interesting, creative work went through years of this. We know our work doesn't have that special thing we want it to have. We all go through this. And if you're just starting out or you're still in this phase, you got to know it's normal. And the most important thing you can do is a lot of work. Put yourself on a deadline so that every week you'll finish one story. It is only by going through a volume of work that you'll close the gap and your work will be as good as your ambitions. And I took longer to figure that out than most anyone I've ever met. It's going to take a while. It's normal to take a while. <laughs> You've just got to fight your way through. So anyway, I think that really, maybe it echoes on a little bit of our conversation. And, um, you know, so that's my pick of the week from Ira Glass. I think that's a really nice insight. That's a wonderful quote. How does it apply to scientists, Nels? I mean, I could see that applying to a writer. You just have to write. The more writing, mm-hmm. the better you're going to get eventually, right? But it's, what about a scientist, Nels? Well, so I would make the case that what we do is very creative. And if you're a, a, a novice at forming and testing a hypothesis, mm. that that takes years of, of hard work and uh, can be frustrating when you're hoping that things will move faster. And what do you do when you've mastered this? You've gotten past it and you get creative and you've been doing it a long time. What about at the end there? Are there any suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody thinks about that. You, it's just you, about you tell getting, me. It's just about getting started. No, I, I have no pearls of wisdom for you. Not today, anyway. Yeah. All right, my pick has to do with something that uh, Jonathan mentioned. This is an article at the, in the Washington Post, and it's about the EPA website removing climate science site from public view after two decades, mm-hmm. All right, which I think is really sad. Um, you know, Many other administrations were not friendly to environmental concerns, the Bush administration, but they didn't take down the pages of scientific facts and data, and that's what the EPA is doing. And uh, I think it's absurd that, you know, they can have one view, but you have to leave the facts there, the scientific observations, the measurements, and so forth. And I think this is really tragic, and it's one of the many things that are happening which are really unfortunate. Yeah, so I agree. Some alarming trends um, pretty recently. It kind of feels to me um, a little bit like our uh, nation's immune system is being tested in a real way. And uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, our, our whole democracy in a way, right? Mm-hmm. In fact, in 1997, the website said, if you're looking for information on climate change, the greenhouse effect, or global warming, you've come to the right place. Mm-hmm. No more. It's <laughs> no gone. More. <laughs> they don't even want to say those, those words anymore. All right, that's uh, Tuivo number 19. You can find it at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash Tuivo. Consider supporting our work. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a variety of ways you can do that, including Patreon and PayPal and so forth. And if you have questions and comments, please send them to Tuivo at microbe.tv. Our guest today, Jonathan Wiener from Columbia University, Jonathan, thanks so much for coming by. What a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hope you enjoyed our conversation. I did. And thanks we, a million, Jonathan. And we think that the way to teach is to have conversations. You, know, you, you mentioned that uh, you don't like the lecture mode, and I totally agree with, with that. I think listening to people chat is a really good way to learn, and that's what we do on our podcast. Nels Eldy is at cellvolution.org. You can also find him on Twitter as L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. This is fun. Great to be back in touch. I should mention that uh, Jonathan has uh, a website, jonathanweiner.com, where you can find information about his books and so forth. We'll also put a link to his uh, Columbia University faculty page. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on Twivo is performed by Trampled by Turtles. You can find their work at trampledbyturtles.com. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Until then, be curious. <laughs>